Hello? Hello. All righty. Let's, uh, let's bring this thing home. So you can get to do your, do your assignments. I'd say the guys up at the back have probably almost finished their assignment. Don't worry, I was doing that when I, I was sitting in your seat. Alrighty. Veronica, would you just mind checking that I haven't turned off the recording? I was mucking around the buttons before. Is, is that alright? Yeah. That's right? Alright, all right, good. Alrighty. Uh, all right, this last section, um, I'm going to talk about alpha sources, which is the actual signals. Um, I'll talk about the diff uh, what actually is alpha, uh, what types of alpha there are, how we, uh, and uh, let's see, well actually, yeah, that, let's see, how we're where I'm going to actually um, today, I'm going to be sort of basically truncating it at number two. So lecture two will actually... Uh, I'm just trying to work out where I stopped. Yeah, it's probably around about two or three is basically where we're truncating today, um, and we'll and we'll pick it pick up again in um, in week thirteen or whenever um, is the next lecture. All right, so um, today I'm going to be co covering off on what alpha is, the types of alpha, and some um, factor construction pitfalls and biases. Uh, so basically, the first three thing, uh, first three uh, items here, and then the next lecture. I'll talk about the actual factor selection process. How do you pick different factors? How do you avoid um, uh, mi data mining, which you may have heard of, worth Googling, um, as well as putting everything into one big multi-factor model. Alrighty. Alpha is basically, well, it's a source of our performance relative to a, a particular stock's risk characteristics. Basically, when you form a, a portfolio of stocks, um, it will quite often be measured against a particular benchmark. Um, and on aggregate, if your if your stocks are, are, are outperforming and buy enough, um, then you you will be outperforming your benchmark. That is what's known loosely as alpha. Um, alpha can be sourced not just from uh, from quantitative signals, but by fundamental analysts and portfolio managers in fundamental shops. So it's not necessarily any speci anything specific to quants. Um, it's it's uh, it's more generally an industry-wide um, uh, measure, basically. Um, um, there is a, there is actually a little bit of controversy around actually. I mean, empirically, you can work out what what alpha is, how much you've outperformed or underperformed, but. Um, there is actually a, a level of controversy about what real alpha actually is because you quite often find fund managers, hedge fund managers or institutional managers loading up on, on, fact, on risk factors, on subtle risk factors for example. Um, so uh, and, and there, is a, there is a correlation between risk and return. If, if, a, if an asset is, is um, or an investment is riskier, they'll tend to be cheaper. Um, and if you hold a, a bunch of them, then you, a lot of the a lot of the um, uh, individual noises cancel each other out, and you can actually get outperformance as a result of ha of, of um, uh, taking on risk. And so, some fund managers will actually um, uh, be kind of sneaky and and, and have more um, in in their in their uh, alpha in their alpha performance. They're actually some of it might actually be really some risk taking as well, so there's that, that's where the controversy can can be. Um, so for quants, um, the types of signals that we um, uh, that we may use, they will actually fall into uh, two different types. One is what's known as factor-based signals, um, and then another type is event-based signals. Um, and where I'm working um, at the moment, we actually do both, um, and in fact, both is good. Um, 
The factor-based ones are, well, you think back to my analogy before about going to a shop and when you buy something, you think about how cheap something is and the actual quality of what, what you're buying. Well, just there, cheap stocks, that's one. Um, quality is another. There are other ones too, momentum. Um, I've forgotten the fourth one. Uh, a, a sentiment as well. Uh, so they're examples of, of factor-based uh, factor ones. And then there's event ones, which are basically like earning surprise um, or M&A targets. Uh, earning surprise is basically trying to, trying to um, pick stocks that um, are likely to outperform um, going into their reporting season. Also, there's something known as the post-earnings announcement drift, where a company, um, once a company is actually uh, r uh, positively surprised the market, say, it may continue to keep drifting, its share price may continue to keep drifting up as the market metabolizes and, in, and it actually impounds the information um, embedded in the accounts into the share price. It's, it's, it, it doesn't, the market's not necessarily completely efficient. When something happens in a market, quite often um, it, it'll have an initial jump of some, some sort, but that, that doesn't mean that it won't have further movements and uh, if you can see a pattern in the further movement, so for quite often you, if, if you get a stock that's made a, a massive drop, it, will, it might sort of drop down and then sort of keep drifting down even further after that. And, and by, uh, by going short that stock at that particular point is actually a way to make, make even more money if you couldn't predict that it was going to drop in the first place. Alrighty. Um, So the idea really is to, is to mix and match all of your uh, signals um, by uh, putting them all together. And so the idea is to come up with a multi-factor model, multi-alpha signal model. Um, and effectively, they, f they form your forecast of what you reckon the, re the returns will be to the stocks that you're actually investing in or that you, you might be investing in. So I've pretty much mentioned this before, but what are, what are the various types of alpha? Well, we mentioned, I mentioned before value, so how cheap something is, quality, so what's its return on equity, what's its stability of, of its margins, what's the strength of its business, which I suppose is, is an implicit way of capturing a biz the strength of a business model. Um, then there's um, so value and quality, are the, are the two dimensions I was talking about before. The um, two other key dimensions are momentum and sentiment, and we're going to talk about how those are, all four actually are calculated. Sometimes you'll, you'll find some of the signals, like value, is actually self-reinforcing. So if you find a ch stock's um, really cheap and looks very attractive, then if more and more people buy it, then the share price will go up and it will start looking less cheap. And that's effectively um, self-correcting. Then there are other, um, other factors which are actually self-reinforcing. So I'll give you an, a, a perfect example, actually, and, and these ex I'll, I'll give you stacks of these examples. But one is the Australian property market. Uh, you, you look at the underlying economics uh, in terms of uh, supply, for example, particularly in New South Wales versus, say, Victoria, um, uh, there's a supply of new housing stock, um, and, then you might and then you might also think about um, also um, demand, and, uh, and I think there's there's been quite a lot of um, demand, for example, not just from uh, uh, investors based in Australia, but also overseas as well, particularly China, I think, um, who regard Australian property market as being quite resilient. And so what, uh, you know, basic, basically economics, what that d d tends to do is drive the um, uh, property prices up. But then it, everyone goes, oh, we're not in, the, we're not in property. We better, you know, or, or, uh, those that aren't in property will go, oh, we're not in property, we better get in there. And then, they, then they'll sort of jo join and uh, with, uh, join the fray and suddenly you get even more pressure on the, um, on the property prices. And so there's, there's a whole kind of um, supply-demand um, interaction from an economics perspective. Um, and that captures the, the whole um, sentiment and momentum aspects. Uh, and these are actually kind of, these are reasonably related in, in the, the whole concept of um, um, bubbles, um, which, which s sentiment and momentum sort of uh, capture different aspects of, has been around forever. Um, you know, and we're not just talking about sort of the um, uh, property market in Australia or the, the tech boom and then bust. Um, 
uh, but also uh, you look back in 1987. Have you, have you guys, hopefully you guys heard of, you've heard of the, um, the 1987 crash in the stock markets, yeah? Some nods, yeah? I hope so. Google it if not. Um, so, but besides that, you can then go back even further. Um, in fact, uh, there was a whole um, Dutch tulip pricing, I think it was about three or 400 years ago. Those of you who are, who are budding economic historians will, uh, um, it's a very interesting um, uh, history to read. In fact, there's some good economic history books out there, by the way, there's books on gold or oil. Uh, Peter Bernstein is, is, is one guy I thought was quite good. Um, I think he did a history of gold. I think he might have done, uh, and then there was another book by Daniel and Daniel Jurgen on, um, on oil. And basically, it, it traces the history of gold. One of them, the first one traces the history of gold. The other one traces the history of, of oil. And they're fascinating because it gives you a, a real sense of how things played out in each of those uh, two spaces. But there are um, uh, you know, interesting facts like, for example, when the Spanish actually, um, actually this is a perfect example of, of sentiment and momentum. When the Spanish um, were grabbing all of the, the gold from the, uh, from the Americas and bringing it back, it caused a massive amount of inflation in, um, in, uh, uh, in Spain. But also did in France as well because the gold was actually leaking across. And there's an aspect in which um, what well, inflation really is about capturing momentum, changes in prices. So um, th th there's a very human, human component to markets and understanding that um, and knowing how to manipulate the, the available data sets to take into that into account is part and parcel of what, what quants do seek to do. Um, enough jibber on that. So um, value in cheap stocks. Well, I mentioned before Farmer and French, they've done a significant amount of work in the area of um, how cheap stocks, particularly book to price um, uh, in the US, is actually a proxy for risk. So stocks priced on their, on their book value, in other words, book to price or price to book, depends on which way you, which way you treat it. Most quants will use book to price. Similar with PEs, by the way. Quants will tend to use earnings yields, not PEs. Uh, we'll talk about that shortly. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the higher the, the earnings yield, in other words, the, the lower the PE, um, the more attractive a stock is from a valuation perspective. Um, and, but it will be cheaper for, usually for a reason. If it's not for a reason, then that's an opportunity to make money. Um, but basically, it'll be, uh, uh, stocks that are cheaper for a, 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 a reason, i.e. they're riskier, um, then you probably don't want necessarily necessarily be, be touching those. But stocks that are, are have been are overly cheap relative to their underlying economic fundamentals, those are the ones that are mispriced and they're interesting. They're the ones that you want to uh, potentially be buying into. Um, I, I note here one behavioural explanation is that the market expectations tend to be more optimistic. Oh, sorry, uh, pessimistic uh, for value stocks. In other words, they're they're oversold, the share price is lower relative to what the actual economic value is versus um, uh, growth stocks, which tend to have very high expectations put on them. And so their share price is a lot higher, but, the, but in reality, they don't live up to the expectations and so their share prices um, will then sort of come up as a result. So um, that's a quite a popular explanation for um, why values, why cheap stocks outperform and why growth stocks actually um, underperform. So, um, so yeah, I did, I've already mentioned this, Farmer and French book to, book to price. Um, I should, should point out, um, actually, does anyone know this? How, how long, how long uh, has uh, the balance sheet of which book to price is, or oh, sorry, the, the book value of a company, how long has the, uh, um, the balance sheet been around for? Anyone can guess? Balance sheet? Someone guess. Sorry? The cash flow statement's been around about 20 years. Um, the income statement's been around for about maybe 100 years. The balance sheet was actually been around for about 600 years. It was first mentioned by um, an Italian accountant called Pacioli about in the 1400s. 
um, and, and, and they actually mentioned double accounting uh, standards, having, having actually, they, there was the innovation of the right hand side of the balance sheet, which was a check and balance, effectively quality assurance on the left hand side. Often regarded as, as a key economic innovation for, for growth, um, because you could actually correctly measure what was going on. Um, the income state, the balance sheet, while the, while the balance sheet actually um, captures the position, um, and it's often known as a statement of financial position, the uh, income statement and cash flow statement both uh, measure from slightly different angles the actual change in the balance sheet, in other words, the profitability of the company. Um, and so the, the, the balance sheet based metrics is what Farmer and French use, while the, um, the uh, flow measures, so that's stock, i.e. Um, that's your position, um, is, is, that's been around for a very long time and how companies would uh, be usually valued hundreds and hundreds of years ago, that top one there. But the, the flow variables, they've been around um, about 100 years. The cash flow statement's been around in its current form roughly um, uh, uh, 25 years or something like that, in a, in a, in a global format. Just realising time, so I'm going to start skipping through a bit quicker. Dividends is also another aspect of, of, of value. And dividend is, is what a, a company actually gives off. So say a company makes a, a bunch of um, earnings, um, they, the company then can actually choose to, to reinvest that money um, into, the, into the firm or give it off as dividends. Um, typically, the higher the, the, the dividends relative to the share price, uh, the, more, the, um, the higher the, the dividend yield, and that makes the company look cheaper. But having said that, watch out for companies that say have got a dividend yield above 20% because they're probably cheap for a reason. If it's, if it's that large, watch out. Um, there are certain types of companies that tend to give off uh, greater dividends. Utilities and banks have sort of been, um, have been key, key examples. Utilities, by the way, and banks, both highly leveraged um, companies. I mean, banks in particular are, are massively leveraged. But that's, that's part of their business model. Okay, so that's, um, that's value. Momentum. Well, I, I think we pretty much talked about momentum, really. This is about, um, about stocks that, uh, that under, uh, underperform, keep underperforming for a while, and the stocks that outperform, keep outperforming for a while. And that, that while usually is about 12 months. Um, in fact, the, the research is, is about, well, categorizes actually momentum in sort of three different, um, three different types. And what I was just characterizing then was known as medium-term momentum and is usually over, say, a 12-month period. Um, there's also um, two other types of momentum, which aren't really momentum, but actually re they're known as reversal. And so what you tend to find is that stocks that have um, gone up in the short term actually tend to reverse. So that's known as short-term reversal. Um, and also, on the other end too, um, th oh, three, three, four, five years, stocks that have um, performed really well over the, uh, in the stock price over the last three or four or five years tend to actually mean revert, either, in other words, they tend to underperform, and, and vice versa. Um, so stocks that have underperformed, for like over three to five, tend to outperform. And a lot of the, a lot of the academic research, written like Journal of Finance, etc., have published research on, on these behavioral anom anomalies. Why can't the market get it right? But um, uh, it's a fa it, it doesn't, and it's definitely a factor that, um, that quants use to, uh, to uh, in the in multi-factor model. Um, we kind of talked about sentiment as well already in terms of um, jumping on board popular trends which can in turn push up prices such as in a property market. Um, the uh, one, me one measure of that is how the analyst forecasts keep changing um, and we'll see this shortly um, if we don't get to it um, in the next 10 minutes, we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you in more detail um, uh, next lecture. But basically, if you track how those earnings estimates, the consensus earnings estimates, for example, have changed through time for a particular, um, for particular stocks, say they keep getting revo revised up, um, there's, there's usually a bit of money to be made there. What typically happens is that sell-side analysts, and this again is behavioural, uh, um, sell-side analysts uh, are reluctant to really go out and say, right, this company, is, its earnings per share is going to be, fa its earnings are going to be fantastic. Um, 
rather they've got reputational risk if they get it wrong. So what they'll do is they'll do it in sm uh, small incremental amounts. Um, what's known as autocorrelation or self-correlation, or b basically um, they'll revise their forecasts incrementally, um, and uh, so it reduces the amount of reputational risk that they have as as sell side analysts. Um, because what they're trying to do is they're trying to attract um, fund managers to broke through uh, to broke through their company, and and in turn that's how that they how brokers make money, and. So what sentiment really is about is is capturing um, uh, ca capturing that autocorrelation in in um, analyst forecasts, um, and it's all it, it, it's it's sorry it's partly about autocorrelation. It's also partly I suppose about sentiment in the sense that it's it's measuring how the market is changing its opinion on a particular companies. So um, the, the, I suppose it's sort of two aspects really to to the sentiment side. Um, and then lastly, quality. Now, I talked to you before about um, uh, Warren Buffett, uh, and uh, who's the CEO of Berkshire Hathaway, and his his style of investing um, you could regard as quality at fair value. So, buying stocks that are good quality, um, but that aren't too expensive. Um, and the idea with quality really is about um, measuring uh, how strong the business is. Is it, in terms of how resilient it is, is it uh, what's its what's its return on equity? And we, we we talked about that before. What's its return on equity? What's it, what's its margins doing? What is its economic prospects doing? It's said that actually Warren Buffett can pick up any uh, any balance sheet and income statement, and then uh, and be able to read it and go, oh, uh, you know, I can see what's going on here. I'm really not attracted to this company, or there's something dodgy going on. You know, there might be something dodgy going on. He was actually quite a strong advocate for the expensive uh, expensing of um, options. Uh, would have been about a decade ago now, which is now commonplace. Um, from a from a uh, perspective of uh, measuring quality, quite often um, uh, one will look at the actual Dupont components, which is which is uh, this link here. It's Dup Dupont is actually a, a massive chemical company. It's one of the oldest companies that's on the New York Stock Exchange. And it's um, uh, and it, it uh, Dupont analysis became famous at Dupont um, because of the way it actually carved up return on equity into its various subcomponents. Those co those components being margins, asset turnover, and also leverage. And in fact, you can you can decompose it in lots uh, in even further further than that. Uh, and so that, those those components, understanding how those components move and vary over the cycle, are important parts of of understanding quality. Um, okay, so um, he, here are here are a bunch of examples um, of of value factors. So we've talked about um, historic. We've talked about earnings to price. So this is basically just the inverse of PE. So if you just um, one divided by PE gives you your earnings yield. How effectively, how, um, if I pay a buck. Uh, for a stock, what percentage of that buck is actually um, do I get back in earnings? That's effectively what earnings yield. Effectively, it's like your your rent. Uh, similar to think of it like your rental yield on your on your um, if you if you own a property. Or yeah, I mean that's that's probably the best example. Um, then is your forecast earnings earnings to price, which is what using the sentiment data from uh, from brokers, and. And then, of course, there's the, the historic dividend yield, which is the uh, the amount of earnings that are just looking at time. Um, the amount of earnings that are actually uh, dispersed to investors in form of dividends. And of course, of course, it's historic book to price. The the um, momentum signals that I was talking to you about before. There's the 12 month momentum one, the one I've got highlighted in red. Um, so that's the one that that they tend to get a certain amount of autocorrelation or self-correlation. So once um, it's kind of like the, the bubble. You can think of it as a bubble factor, I suppose. Um, whereas one month change in price, that's more about the, that's about reversion. Um, the sentiment ones we uh, I mentioned before about the change in consensus, change in uh, forecast.